that thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow heart, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul. Whatever thou be, until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan, finishing school graduate, Pinky's out. Oh, Mm -hmm. I didn't know we were going with special titles. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm Lindsay, boss of everything and ruler of your world. Uh, But you didn't go to finishing school. I didn't need to. I finished you. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, that also an- sounded really inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, I did. No announcements today. Um, how many? You're just telling one story. You said right. It, yeah, yeah. This is the random one. We're both just telling one story. I know. We're usually better about coordinating that, but mm-hmm. you know what? We're just going to try. Out. We're just going to try it out. It's going to be fine. It's still yeah. going to be the same length. Mm-hmm. Same amount know? of words, so, if you will. We we do track the word count. Um, so, what's your story about today? Stuff. Stuff. Yeah. That's Scary we, stuff, hopefully. That that's uh what what we say at my finishing school. Okay. Stuff. Stuff. It's cool. Uh yeah. So okay, this is uh a I am excited about this story because it brings forward a character that I uh had never heard of. Mm. Uh a, a concept, an idea. It's biblical in nature, which I didn't know. Uh, oh, you mentioned the story, but yes, okay. Yeah, because I, I I don't want to give too much away, but I asked you, I was like, if I said X, mm-hmm. would you know? And you were like, Oh yeah, that's a bu-. and I was like, Oh. Uh so I'm I'm really excited about it. It actually sent me down my own rabbit hole, which yeah. I generally try not to over research anything that's being shared because I want to bring that element of surprise or uh, newness, yeah. you know. So I don't like to go too deep, but I ended up in a wormhole, and I'm like pretty into the story. Okay, now. cool. Yeah, cool. so we're gonna go to Louisiana, and we're gonna have a bizarre hunting creature in the woods folklore combo story it's a and it's a really well told story as well you know my my story also i think is really well told the modern encounter uh it really it, it really drew me in um it, this is a big story that'll take us to las vegas where we'll learn a lot about um the people who have died at the luxor hotel and casino oh kind of a lot of the history there and then i'll share is a, that the triangle one yep the pyramid yeah. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise known as a triangle. And then I'll share a longer than normal modern encounter tale uh, from a woman who claims she had a terrifying encounter in the triangle uh, when she stayed there once as a little kid. The old Egyptian triangle. <laughs> no, well, no, no, because there's a hotel that is like Egypt themed, but then there's one that has like a triangular, like a prism. Like a pyramid. Yeah, but it's like, uh, yes, but like uh, more, it like feels more like psychedelic, like in a Pink Floyd kind of way, mm-hmm. not in like a yeah. built of sand you know, in the desert, it just feels like a a prism that like it projects like the like a light. I don't know. Okay. I, th- I think I think that's a Luxor. I think I know what you're talking about, but uh, not sure. Uh, once you're once you're socked up, I love how confused you are right now. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> it reminds me of our personal conversation. Lindsay is the queen of tangents. There's lots of it's never a linear. It's story. not a tangent. I was asking you if it was this specific hotel. Mm. Yeah. I don't think you know your Las Vegas hotels. I think I know them better than you do. Okay. These socks came from summer camp from our very good friends, Eddie and Gregory. Aw, love them. I do love them. Okay, so this story is a bit of a slow burn, but it, uh, yeah, really captivated me and I hope it does for everyone else who hears it. The Luxor Hotel and Casino, the ancient Egypt-themed resort, provides its guests with a vacation filled with luxury, relaxation, entertainment, adventure, and maybe a bit of terror. Built to resemble an Egyptian pyramid, The gigantic property opened in 1993, and since then, it has become a staple of the Las Vegas Strip. It has also garnered a sinister reputation for being one of the most haunted hotels in Nevada. Its dark history is laden with mysterious deaths, suicides, murders, even a bombing in 2007, and rumors of the hotel's paranormal activity began before the hotel even opened to the public. Originally, the Luxor was owned and being developed by Circus Circus Enterprises before being sold to MGM in 2005. During the construction of the hotel, the CEO of Circus Circus at the time, William Bennett, was able to keep the cost of opening the Luxor remarkably low. Initial cost of development was $350 million, although that may sound like an insane amount of money. Uh, The Mirage Casino Resort, which opened with a similar property size and a number and similar number of attractions, was built just four years prior for a cost of $650 million. Yikes! 
Various sources say that the Luxor's construction was a rushed job as it was completed in just 18 months, six months less than it took to build the Mirage, and that Bennett may have dangerously cut a lot of corners in order to save money and open to the public on time. And the cutting of those corners may have directly led to multiple lives also being cut short. Reportedly, at least two construction workers died while on the job at the Luxor, but their deaths were covered up by Circus Circus. But the conglomerate could not make the two victims' lives disappear completely. To this day, visitors report sightings of two men walking the property in what looks like construction vests, glossy-eyed and confused, looking for an exit they're never able to find. Another spirit frequently witnessed at the Luxor is simply known as the Blonde Woman on the 12th floor of the hotel. Sightings of her are most commonly accompanied by the feeling of a phantom hand caressing one's face and cheeks. And that's not the only, I guess specifically the cheeks on the face, and that's not the only odd physical sensation that certain unlucky guests of the Luxor have been beset by when they visited its haunted halls. Some visitors, especially those that stay on the 10th floor and above, have reported feeling like they're being choked in their beds Ugh. when no one else is around or being paralyzed by the horrifying physical sensation of someone pushing down on their chest while they sleep, like they're being pressed deep into the mattress. Sleep paralysis or something more? Others, many others in fact, have reported hearing disembodied voices mumbling in their ears or crying in the corner of their empty hotel room. How would you like to wake up to that after a long night of gambling and partying? I feel like there's a lot of crying that happens in Vegas. Probably. Uh, Still others claim to have seen what had to have been uh, spirits walk directly off the interior balcony and descend quickly towards the atrium floor only only to disappear before smashing into the ground. The most common paranormal claim for those visiting the Luxor is that it feels like you're walking into a field of unmarked graves when you enter, like the whole place is swollen with heavy, anonymous pain. With its forbidding pyramid shape and a giant sphinx guarding the entrance, during its construction, the Luxor's opening became a highly anticipated event, not just in Las Vegas, but in America. And although it did end up opening on time, at 4 a.m., October 14th, 1993, the building was not yet completed when guests were welcomed in. That didn't seem to bother anybody. People still flooded its massive atrium and clamored to the casino. Some even stayed in rooms that weren't 100% finished yet. And then shortly after the Luxor's grand opening, the consequences of its hasty construction began to show itself. Because the hotel is shaped like a pyramid, instead of traditional elevators, the Luxor uses what they call inclinators, which are pretty much the same thing as an elevator, except they travel at a 39-degree angle up the four sides of the pyramid instead of moving directly up and down. That's weird. Yeah, these inclinators didn't work properly when the hotel first opened. Oh, no. And guests were continuously getting stuck in them, suspended, dangling above the bustling lobby below, a lobby that was also sinking. Unknown to Circus Circus, the Luxor was built on a soft spot in the desert floor, which threatened the integrity of the very foundation of the 6.2 million ton building. Quickly, they had to find a solution to reinforce its base to avoid further tragedies or lawsuits. Uh, Now for a few notable deaths that have occurred since it, since it opened. Three years after it opened in September of 1996, a woman committed suicide by jumping from the interior balcony of the 26th floor of the Luxor. She landed dramatically in front of numerous witnesses at the entrance of the crowded buffet. Fuck. The impact of her hitting the tile floor from so high thankfully killed her instantly. It was also an extremely gory death. She was so disfigured by the impact that the Clark County Coroner's Office was initially unable to identify her. Oh, God. A Las Vegas Sun article from September 26, 1996, describes the incident. The woman jumped from a 26th floor balcony about 1 p.m. Wednesday and landed at the entrance to the buffet area, Metro Police said. Witnesses reported seeing her sitting on the railing with her feet dangling over just before she jumped, Sergeant Bill Keaton said. The Luxor's hotel rooms face a 30-story atrium overlooking the casino inside the pyramid-shaped building. Police have, quote, no idea who she is, Keaton said. The coroner's office is using fingerprints and dental records to attempt to identify her, a spokesman said today. This unknown woman was the first of many to die tragically at the Luxor. In 1997, 16-year-old Sarah Gruber was murdered by 30-year-old Michael Hathaway in the Luxor. The teenager was originally from Mountain View, California, was working as a sex worker in Nevada at the time. Another archived Las Vegas Sun article titled Arrest and Luxor Slain from October 17th, 1997 described Sarah's gruesome murder as follows. And this is uh, uh, pretty rough. Sarah Gruber, 16, was found dead by a maid at the Luxor shortly after 9 a.m. Tuesday, police said. Also found in the room were her purse and an Arizona driver's license out of Phoenix, 
Homicide, Lieutenant Wayne Peterson said. It was later learned that the ID under the name Alana Alvarado and the age 21 was fake, Peterson said. It had her picture on it and it appeared to be a valid Arizona ID, he said. The hotel room was registered to Hathaway, who checked into the Luxor on October 12th. Detectives originally believed Hathaway was still in the Las Vegas area because he had not used his return airline ticket to Oakland. Investigators found the airline ticket in Hathaway's hotel room, Peterson said. An autopsy determined that Gruber died from asphyxiation by strangulation. Hathaway allegedly met Gruber at a bar in the Luxor, and the two later went to his room, police said. Once in his room, Hathaway sexually assaulted the teenage girl, then strangled her to death, proceeded to rape her corpse, Ugh. rob her, and fled. Michael Hathaway was caught, would take a plea bargain, and was sentenced to life in prison, but with the possibility of parole after 20 years. Fuck you. He's been up for parole three times now. Thankfully, he has been denied each of those times. Good. Rotten hell. What room did this murder occur in? Sources don't say. Whenever you stay at the Luxor, you may be staying in this exact same room where this terrible crime occurred. A decade after Sarah's murder, on May 7th, 2007, 24-year-old casino worker Wil Wilbaldo Durantes Antonio was killed in the explosion of a pipe bomb in the parking garage of the Luxor. Mm -hmm. A man named Porfirio Duarte Herrera created the homemade bomb and had set it on the roof of, a vic of the victim's car under a plastic cup. The bomb was detonated when Durantes Antonio went to remove the cup and it killed him instantly. Holy shit. Despite the bomb and the murder, the Luxor chose not to evacuate any guests. It continued operations as usual. Murders almost never slow the action of a Las Vegas casino. If one were to happen when you're staying there, you probably wouldn't even know about it. Crazy addendum to this tragedy. While looking further into the crime, we found out that in September of 2022, Duarte Herrera escaped prison where he was serving a life sentence for first degree murder. He was able to escape by chipping away at a portion of his cell window with battery acid. Okay, that feels like something out of a movie. Yeah, he made it out. Uh, he was thankfully found two days after his escape, uh, after nearly making it to Tijuana, Mexico. He'd already bought a fake ID, had his ticket to ride down there. Luckily, somebody who worked at the shuttle company recognized the wanted poster. Damn. Much more recently, on June 29th, 2023, 18-year-old Emma Kusak shot and killed a 36-year-old man named Charlie Strautrustegui on the 12th floor of the Luxor. The two originally met on the dating app Bumble and had been texting for two months before Charlie invited her to come meet him while he was staying in Las Vegas from California, or visiting Las Vegas. After turning herself in, Emma originally told police she shot herself in self-defense. However, she later admitted that she murdered him on accident after he tried to kick her out of the room. According to the arrest report, Emma said she didn't mean to shoot him and didn't want to shoot him, but she had nowhere to go and didn't want to go back to jail. Emma said she impulsively shot Charlie. There are dozens of other accounts of horrifying deaths that have taken place inside the Luxor. Like the casino employee who was murdered in 2012 by her boyfriend in the hotel lobby. Holy shit. While dozens, if not hundreds of terrified guests looked on. And the two unrelated suicides and two unrelated suicides where victims jumped from the exact same spot on the 10th floor. An alarming amount of premature deaths actually take place in Vegas every year. I didn't know these stats. On average, of the 40 million non-Clark County residents that visit Sin City each year, about a thousand of them will die. And a high percentage of those deaths are suicides. Statistically, the odds of dying by suicide in Las Vegas are twice as high as anywhere else in the United States. It's been referred to by some as the suicide capital of America. And on top of all the reported deaths, there are allegedly many, many more that are never reported, especially if they occur at a big popular hotel and casino like the Luxor. According to multiple sources, when someone dies at one of the massive resort casinos in Las Vegas, the hotel will do everything in its power to cover it up or at the very least, keep it out of the public eye. One way hotels supposedly do this is if someone dies in a hotel room, employees will move the body to a different area before authorities show up because if authorities discovered in the room, that room will be quarantined for two weeks. So really, who knows how many people have died in various rooms of the Luxor? Places like the Luxor are the driving force of the Las Vegas economy. And if tourism plummets, then Vegas plummets. So a lot of deaths are commonly believed to be swept under the proverbial rug. In addition to the many deaths that have occurred within its walls, there are other eerie things about the Luxor that may have led to it being haunted. Many believe that the hotel was destined to be cursed from the start. Not only was it built to imitate the ancient Egyptian pyramids with decor inspired by Egyptian iconography, but until it was scrapped in 2008, the Luxor boasted having a replica of King Tut's tomb as its main attraction. The exhibit was worth $3 million and was actually one of two replicas in the world, only two, 
authorized by the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities as being authentic. The exhibit included over 500 fake artifacts, golden statues, mummies, and chariots, and of course the sarcophagus of Tutankhamun, the third to last pharaoh of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt. Many believe that if there's a surefire way of pissing off powerful ancient spirits, appropriating an important part of Egypt's history and using it as a commodity to make money would probably be that. Additionally, in 2008, the Luxor unveiled a permanent exhibit exhibit about the sinking of the Titanic. This is how the website describes the attraction. Experience the wonder and tragedy of the world's most famous ocean liner, Titanic. Viewed by more than 25 million people worldwide, the exhibition is one of the highest attended in history. Over 250 authentic artifacts recovered from the wreck side of the Titanic, as well as extensive recreations of some of the most famous rooms from the ship, make this an educational and entertaining experience perfect for all ages. That may be the premise, or promise, of the Luxor's newest feature, but it seems that since its installment 16 years ago, it has also brought an influx of paranormal activity down on unsuspecting guests. Some believe that the reason the hauntings have increased since its establishment is because many of the authentic artifacts that it has on display are the personal items of drowned victims. Perhaps the restless souls of those items belong uh, of who those items belong to are enraged by the exploitation of their tragic deaths. The Titanic isn't the only grim exhibit at the Luxor. Also introduced in 2008, Bodies the Exhibition is another one of the hotel's massively popular attractions. Bodies is meant to showcase the intricacies of the human form, and according to the Luxor website, the exhibit includes 13 whole body specimens and more than 260 organs and partial body specimens. It goes on to say, these real human bodies have been meticulously dissected, preserved through an innovative process. The bodies are respectfully presented, giving visitors the opportunity to view the beauty and complexity of their own organs and systems. The exhibition provides an up-close look inside our skeletal, muscular, respiratory, and circulatory systems. Although it's been done in the name of science, the addition of these stripped, dissected, mutilated human bodies to the Luxor have no doubt added to its spine-chilling atmosphere. And some wonder, are the former owners of these bodies being displayed, perhaps not altogether thrilled about how their corpses are being treated? According to a 2006 NPR article, the company behind the bodies exhibit which had been on tour in museums around America before landing a permanent residency at the Luxor, provided no evidence that the bodies on display came from legitimate sources, and no paper trail or documentation of any kind to certify consent from the dead person to be put on display is known to exist. Okay, now that we know a bit about the Luxor's macabre history, let's dive into a first-hand account of a supposed run-in with one of its many, many ghosts. Time now for the tale of Ding Dong He's dead. I've never liked Vegas. When I was a kid, my mom used to drag my brother and I there for the weekend to visit her best friend from college, our Aunt Michelle. Not really our aunt. I never liked Aunt Michelle. She talked too loud, reeked of cigarettes, ate with her mouth open, and always seemed to be looking for excuses to kiss my brother's cheek. She was weird, and she grossed both of us out. But my mom loved her. So at least once a month, we would make the three and a half hour drive, sometimes four if we stopped at In-N-Out, from San Bernardino to Vegas. While they got their nails done and shopped and played on the slot machines, my brother Sammy and I would stay at Aunt Michelle's house on the west side of the city with her daughter, Caitlin, who even my mom thought was a brat. At least we were, in all, we were all in agreement about her. Caitlin was four years older than me, or I guess still is four years older than me. We fell out of touch pretty soon after the story took place. So when I was nine and Sammy was 11, she was 13. Because of her age gap and the fact that her mom let her watch R-rated movies like Basic Instinct whenever she wanted, Caitlin thought that meant she was wise and worldly, and that we were dumb and childish. Whenever Aunt Michelle and my mom would take off for the day, they would leave us with money to order a pizza and a DVD from Blockbuster, one that my mom actually approved of, and would tell us to do something fun like play Clue. I never liked Clue. I never liked anything really about these weekends at Aunt Michelle's, but I understand why my mom needed them. She and Aunt Michelle were both single mothers working full-time jobs, And I think that they sort of helped each other carry the weight of it all. But that didn't make it any less boring and soul-sucking for Sammy and I to sit on that itchy living room carpet, playing Clue for the zillionth time while Caitlin smacked her gum and rolled her eyes at us from her beanbag in the corner. I remember one time, Caitlin interrupted me, just as I was about to accuse Mrs. Peacock of doing it in the billiard room with a candlestick. She said something like, God, you guys are so boring. We should do something that's actually fun. Sammy turned around and looked up at her. Fun like how? I remember her leaning over 
on her elbows uh, that were on her knees, like all dramatic. And she had this really intense look in her eyes. It freaked me out. Be before she even suggested what fun thing she thought we should do, I knew I was going to hate it. We should go ding-dong ditching, she said triumphantly, still chewing gum with her mouth open just like her mom and looked at us expectedly. Sammy and I just stared back. I was nine for Christ's sakes. Sammy was just 11. Neither of us had ever heard of ding-dong ditching. It sounded so stupid and like she had made it up. When she realized we had no idea what she was talking about, she flung herself back in the beanbag, laughing. Oh my God, you guys are such babies. Come on, Caitlin, just tell us what it is. I asked quietly, almost under my breath. As much as she annoyed me, she also really intimidated me. Okay, okay. So it's where we go to a neighbor's house. Maybe like Mr. Frank across the street because he's a total perv and a creep and totally deserves to be freaked out. And we just ring his doorbell a bunch. Then right as he's about to open the door, run away as fast as we can. I hated this idea. I was a really shy kid and deathly afraid of getting in trouble. Luckily, I was sure Sammy was going to be just as opposed to the idea as me, which would save me the trouble of having to tell Caitlin no. But to my horror, Sammy just said, okay, sounds fun. Before I knew what was happening, they were both getting up and going to put their flip-flops on. I didn't know what to say, so I just sat there, kind of staring at the clue board. Aren't you coming, Emily? Hello? Earth to Emily? I, I don't know, guys. It just, it doesn't sound very nice. Like, I just think Mama wouldn't want us to do something like that, Sammy. Plus, we haven't finished our board game. I think I know who did it. And, and I want to finish playing with you. I looked up at them, waiting for my brother to respond. Sammy? God, Emily, you're such a fucking baby. We don't want her to come with us anyway, Sam. She'll just ruin it by being so much of a baby, sneered Caitlin. It was the first time I'd ever heard a kid I knew say the word fucking. And it might have been the first time she'd ever said it herself. I remember noticing, even though I was little, that it sounded clumsy coming out of her mouth but it still shocked me just the same. I waited for Sammy to say he would stay behind and play Clue with me, but he didn't. Yeah, Emily, you're too much of a baby. Just stay here, he said, and they were gone. I know it sounds silly to say that almost two decades later, the story still makes me sad, but that moment was a big turning point for us, for Sam and I. After that, every time we came to Vegas, they did everything together without me telling me I was too much of a wimp or too much of a baby to join in whatever they were doing. We just kind of drifted apart, and it wasn't until we were both in our early 20s that we started to become real friends again. But even now, we're not as close as we were before that moment. But that's not what the story is about. I tell you all of this so you can understand why later that year, I did what I did. And although I know I can't make you believe me, maybe you'll give my story a bit more credit if you know that it was something that I never did. I was not a troublemaker. I was not a liar. I couldn't even lie to my mom when she asked me if I brushed my teeth before bed. So there was no way at nine years old, I would have, could have lied about something like the story I'm going to tell. The whole ding dong ditch situation happened in early June or July, I think, because it wasn't that far after my ninth birthday, which was in May. Fast forward to February of the next year. I'm still nine, but now Caitlin's 14 and Sammy is 12. They've been becoming better and better friends for the past six or so months. And I was getting more and more edged out of their little group. I was basically spending every trip to Vegas at that point, laying on Aunt Michelle's trampoline, reading the warrior books. You know the ones about the cats? Yeah, I was not a very cool little kid. Whatever. I still love those books. Aunt Michelle was dating some guy who worked in the mega resort business, and for Valentine's Day, he got rooms at the Luxor Hotel and Casino for her, my mom, and all of us kids as a gift. Of course, Aunt Michelle was staying in a room with the creepy hotel guy. My mom got her own, and all of us kids were lumped together in another room. I desperately did not want to go on this trip. I begged and begged my mom to let me stay at a friend's house in San Bernardino but she said that because it was a gift from this guy, it would be rude not to come. So on some Friday afternoon, after my mom got home from a half day at work, she was a kindergarten teacher at a local elementary school, the three of us departed. Their plan was to meet Aunt Michelle, Caitlin, and the hotel guy, whose name I think was Jerry, but I can't really remember, in the Luxor's lobby that evening. Although we spent a lot of time in Las Vegas, Sammy and I had never really spent any time on the strip. My mom wouldn't allow it. When we got there, Sammy was excited by all the lights and the glamor and the noise and the people. I think he'd always felt like he was missing out on something by being so close to the center of Las Vegas, but never actually getting to go into the casinos. I was not. I was scared. I remember even as a kid, I had this distinct feeling that everybody around me was hiding something. I tightened my orange Jansport backpack and grabbed my mom's hand. Although whenever I see it now, it just looks worn out and dilapidated. When I walked past the massive Sphinx's paws for the first time, all I could think was how menacing and greedy it looked. Like at any moment, its creepy vacant head would plunge down and swallow me whole. My mom squeezed my hand twice and said, Exciting, right? I was about to reply, No, but was cut off by the shrieking sound of Aunt Michelle's voice. 
with her beady little hawk eyes. She had spotted us from across the drop-off area ahead, where she, Jerry, and Caitlin were unloading their bags from a taxi. My mom waved enthusiastically and dragged Sam and I through the Sphinx's chest to go and greet them. I remember thinking how weird it was that we were in this thing's underbelly, but no one else seemed to mind. Upon entering the Luxor, Caitlin and Sam were elated. I remember Sam was especially enraptured by the weird diagonal elevators and the balconies that stretched way above our heads and the paintings that looked like they were a thousand years old or something. We had been inside for less than 10 seconds before they took off running in the direction of, if I remember correctly, King Tut's tomb. I gripped my mom's hand even harder. Why don't you go and play while we check in, honey? She said. No, it's okay, I mumbled. 30 minutes later, she was dropping me, Sam, and Caitlin off at our hotel room on the 11th floor. Okay, kids, now Aunt Michelle and I are just one floor below you, she said with her hands on her hips. If anything happens, you can just run down the stairs and grab us. We're going to go to the casino for a little while, but here's some money for dinner. Get whatever you want from the dining hall. After that, you can either hang out in the lobby or come back up here. Nothing else. Got it? We all nodded, and Caitlin took the money eagerly. When my mom was gone, she came and stood over me while I was sitting in my bed on the little pull-out couch. Listen, Emily, Sam and, a- Sam and I are going to go to that pizza place next door we saw on the way here. You can just order room service or something while we're gone, she said, and she handed me ten bucks. I think they sell pizza downstairs, I said quietly to the floor, avoiding her beady gaze. Oh my God. Sam, come on, let's go. I knew there was no point in trying to get them to stay, so I just kept staring at the floor until they were gone. I wanted to go get my mom, but I knew that would only make things worse with Caitlin and Sam. Plus, she was probably all the way down in the casino by then, and I was too scared of that creepy lobby and all the creepy people inside it to go find her. Evidently, I was also too scared to go get food alone or even call room service. So I just snacked on a Snickers bar and read my book, hoping they'd be back soon. And eventually, they did come back. They ran into the room laughing and breathing hard. I stood up eagerly to greet them. What's so funny, guys? Hey, what's so funny? Caitlin just waved her hand dismissively at me. Don't worry about it, she said through fits of more giggles. At that point, I was desperate. You know the kind of desperation that you have as a little kid to just get other kids to like you, to pay attention to you? Hey, hey, I said as loud as I could muster. Sammy looked up at me. What? I, I started, I didn't actually have a plan for what I was going to say next, but the words kind of spilled out. I want to go play ding dong ditching. I mean, I want to ding dong ditch someone. All right, finally, Caitlin said. At first, I was horrified at what had just come out of my mouth, but their animated approval and encouragement quickly washed away all my nerves. I actually felt excited. Okay, okay, said Sammy. This is great. Who do you want to do it to? I saw some gross old people go into a room a couple doors down. That'd be kind of funny. No, interrupted Caitlin. No, I have a better idea. She should go up to the top floor. How many floors are there? It doesn't matter. Just go to the top one. Choose a room in the middle of the hallway. Are you guys coming? I asked. No. Now this is all you, she declared. I noticed in that moment she was still chewing gum and my excitement started to fade. But how will you know if I did it? Don't you want to see? No, you got it. We'll know if you're lying, said Sam. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. They walked me to the entrance of the elevator, uh, hyping me up the whole way and told me to press the button for floor 30, and I did. When the golden doors shut, separating me from them and the little room began to surge upwards at a horrible diagonal, I wanted to cry. I so desperately did not want to do what I said I would. But even more than that, I didn't want to risk their wrath and ridicule if I didn't. I just never expected them to send me off alone. That wasn't what I wanted at all. Since I was only nine, I truly believed they would be able to tell if I lied. Thinking that I had no other choice, I readied myself for the task at hand. When the doors opened on the 30th floor, the first thing I noticed was how quiet it was. Since we had arrived on the strip, there had been consistently a muted cacophony of sound in the background. Even when I was alone in my room, I could hear people talking in the room next door. I wanted to stay in the elevator, but was suddenly very afraid that if I didn't exit the little golden room, it would suddenly drop and plunge to the ground with me in it. Tentatively, I stepped onto the purple floral carpet and looked around. I decided the best way to do this was to get it over with as fast as possible. So I went to the first room I saw on my right. Before I could stop myself, I knocked hard on the door. But then I was stricken with a horrible realization. I didn't know what I was supposed to do next. I forgot the rules that Caitlin had explained. Was I supposed to keep knocking until I heard them start to open the door and then run away? Or could I just run away now? Would they know if I played the game wrong? What if it doesn't count? Would they make me do it again? I didn't want to do it again. In the midst of my panic, the door suddenly swung open. I was paralyzed. I didn't move. Thinking I was about to get in trouble, I immediately began apologizing for knocking and saying that it was just a game and I really didn't mean to bother anyone. But then my voice trailed off. There was no one behind the door. The room was completely empty and dark. Only a gray light 
slipping out from under the closed bathroom door did anything to meekly illuminate the room. Um, I'm sorry, I whispered and began to slowly back away from the door. But as terrified as I was, I couldn't stop staring at the room. My eyes remained fixed on something I thought I saw that just appeared on the far side of the room. Or maybe I just didn't notice it right away. It was a man, or rather the silhouette of a man, standing perfectly still against the wall, barely made visible by the dim bathroom light. I started to apologize again. I, I, I'm sorry, I, he started to run. It was like he peeled his body off the wall and launched himself at me with an anger, a hatred, a violence I'd never witnessed before or since, I guess. I screamed a blood-curdling, vomit-inducing scream. I actually did throw up as the man grabbed me by the shoulders and stared hard into my face. But he couldn't stare. Not really. He couldn't see. Where his eyes should have been were swollen, blistering pockets of blood-colored goo and jelly spilling down his cheeks. I screamed and I screamed and I screamed and eventually he started to scream too. His face just inches from mine. He forced open his jaw, pulling his dry and bleeding lips apart and revealing a rotten mouth. Teeth decaying, tongue festering, his breath so repugnant that I felt bile well up in my throat and I thought I was going to throw up again. He screamed and screamed and screamed into my face, a nauseating, demonic scream, louder and louder, digging his nails deeper and deeper into my shoulders. I flailed my little body around, trying to break free of his grasp, and eventually I did. I hit the ground and started running, wailing, crying for help. I don't know how long it took me, how far I ran, but at some point an old woman scooped me up and calmed me down. I don't really have a recollection of anything after that, but I know that I must have told her what I saw. Being a kind person, she looked past all the crazy details of my rant, like his melting eyes and rotten teeth, and focused on the fact that she had just found a little girl screaming and crying about a man who scared her. She and her husband, who I guess at some point must have joined us in the hallway, brought me downstairs to the lobby to go find help. Like I said, I don't remember much, but I know I must have been in hysterics the whole way. Unfortunately, my story kind of ends there. The old couple told what I had said to the receptionist, who told the security guard, who went up to the 30th floor to go investigate. Somehow they found my mom in the insanely, crow insanely crowded casino, and she ran across the lobby to find me. God love her, she was the only person that believed me, or at least acted like she did. The people at the Luxor told her that what I said was nonsense, and that the room I supposedly saw the demon man in was currently occupied by a family of four. Fed up and more pissed off than I've ever seen her, my mom cursed out the receptionist and security guard and whoever else was behind the counter that night for not taking the claims of her very scared child more seriously. My mom was great that night. She stayed with me in her room the rest of the evening, just the two of us. We ordered room service, macaroni and cheese, ice cream sundaes, and watched a Disney movie or two. She didn't even act annoyed with me when I begged her to let me sleep in the same bed. And she must have said something to Sam and Caitlin because I don't remember them ever teasing me about what happened. I don't remember much of the vacation other than that I had a nightmare that night, and, and maybe the next night. And the next morning, I showed my mom little bruises that had appeared where the man had dug his nails into my shoulders. Based on how she reacted, I actually think she believed my story, or at least that something terrible had happened to me. I will never forget that man's face, that scream, the memory of him peeling himself off the wall, running and grabbing me, screaming the way he did. It's burned crystal clear into my brain forever. I wish I had more to share with you, but I don't. I have no idea what it was that I saw. I never saw anything else, but I know I saw that. Ugh. And also, poor little Emily. I know, I know. Emily. I know. This, I just really like this story. It just painted such a good picture yeah. of like, I was not the little sibling, but it's like, I thought of my little sister, Donna, and I can totally see this perspective of like, you never get included. Yeah. You know, when you want to do stuff, you just get laughed at, you know, just get picked on. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You were that uh, sibling. I was a little kid. Oh man. Did you feel yourself in the story a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was pretty cool. So, <laughs> you know, like. Sometimes people picked me over my brother, so. Nice. When you guys were only two years apart. Uh, almost three. Well, I guess I think they were about that in this story. Yeah, Don and I, you know, it's like a bigger gap. Yeah, it is harder when there's a bigger gap. Mm-hmm. Because you're just, I was just talking to our stepsister about this, uh, just like a family get together and saying like, you know, it's hard because our niece, Eleanor, is just mm -hmm. at that age where it's like, she's still a little kid, but she's not a little kid. And it's, and it's hard because there's like kids older than her mm -hmm. and she's not quite on the same level as them. And then the little littles, she's also definitely not on their level. I know. I know. Those, she's on a little island right now. I know. It's hard. And she's smart. So oh, it's like she's very aware uh -huh. that they don't want to play with her. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and she knows it's not about her, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't stinks. hurt her feelings. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sweet little baby. Yeah, I this know. my girl. Mm -hmm. Oh. Do you have pictures? I do. I want so, to talk about the Luxor. I'm 
<laughs> okay, okay. I'm I'm talk about the triangle. <laughs> I have an exterior photo of the Luxor Hotel and Casino here. Perfect. And then this next one, interior photo of the lobby. I don't think I've ever been inside the Luxor. Well, it's defunct now, right? No, it's still there. It's still there? And I think it, it may have a light shooting from the center of the pyramid up into the sky. That might be the one you're thinking about. I, this I big think black it, pyramid. Yeah, I think it is the same. But in my is. mind, I I wasn't thinking that it was black. I was mm. thinking that it was white and sleek. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I I think I think might be mixing it up with a hotel in London. Oh. Um, but also, the last time we were in Vegas, all the water... Um, like the the water shows. Uh, oh yeah, I don't know what else to call them. Like in the front of the hotels, uh -huh. like at the Bellagio and like stuff. The Bellagio. Well, the fountains. Yeah, fountains. fountains yeah. Thank you. Um, are all were all shut down. Yeah, uh, as like a water Drought. conservation mm -hmm. thing. And I I think that there was like a water feature here, and that's why I thought it was mm. closed. Um, this next one exterior photo of the hotel during the construction process. I I remember this just because it just this happens to coincide when I was like down there for a couple years. Oh, yeah. So I, I just remember people talking about it. I mean, I was like freshman, sophomore in high school, but I remember like driving by it and it was like a, a big deal that they were going to have this like at the time when it was, you know, came, yeah. it was like the new cool big casino. Um, this next one is the Sphinx entrance to the casino that she talked about walking under. I mean, that is really weird. Mm -hmm, just if you're a little kid. Uh, this next picture, this is the cover of the first book, Into the Wild in the Warriors book series. <laughs> I was curious if you knew about these. Published in oh, 2003. Yeah. By a collection of authors, all writing under the pseudonym Aaron Hunter, the books re revolve around Nightheart, Sunbeam, and Frostpaw, cats from different warrior feral cat clans. River Clan's leader and deputy die, and Star Clan doesn't show them who's supposed to be the next cat leader. Uh, additionally, there was growing unrest amongst the cats, <laughs> cats of the clans regarding various changes made to the warrior code. Um, yeah, there's 48 of these books. I didn't know that there were that many, but I am... Vaguely familiar with them. Neither one of our kids got into them, mm -mm. but I just like remember seeing them either at the bookstore or yeah. Scholastic Book Fair or whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. Now for something a little bit spooky. Uh, the, this next picture is the remains of a vivisected man oh, on yeah. display at the Luxor's Bodies exhibit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy. That's that's real parts. That's a real it, uh, corpse. There. How this is like the one exhibit in Vegas that every time, and we don't go that often. I know, I, also, I do want to check it out. I do too. I don't give a shit about Vegas. I'm not a Vegas lover. It's one of my least favorite places in the world. But there's some cool exhibits. Exactly. Yeah, I like going to Vegas for certain things, yeah. They have a meow wolf now. Yeah, that'd be cool too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that, maybe that vivisected man was, uh, maybe his spirit is angry and screaming. The only thing I remember about the bodies is like when that exhibit first came out, I believe that the exhibit, one of the stops in it, had uh, a set of lungs from a smoker oh. and I remember people talking about like how just uh, disturbing how it is of yeah. like holy shit what am I doing to my body um, one more uh, display this this next one's interesting anatomical exhibit from uh, from the same bodies exhibits uh, this would be nightmare fuel for some people feels like uh, Westworld uh, kind of stuff uh huh what is going on with those bands? That's like where the skin just showing like what it like, like the skin and then fatty tissue underneath the skin. Oh. And then next level down is like the muscle. So just displaying the body in a different way, like the layers of the body. Okay. And I believe that's all like real human skin and everything. I know. I feel like it might make me a little bit nauseous. Mm -hmm. That's Yeah. It's intense looking. Mm -hmm. But also really cool. Like when do we get to see the insides of our bodies? I know. In, in a, in that sort of tangible kind of way. Like we can see x-rays, we can look at photos, we can watch surgery. Yeah. But like, we're not, you know, if you are somebody who enjoys watching surgery. Yeah. It's not like you're actually in the viewing room of a OR. Mm -hmm. You know, you're watching it uh, on TV or a mm -hmm. YouTube video or whatever, like to be that close. Yeah. Aspiring medical students and just random people yeah. interested in human anatomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and, and I'm curious, like you said, like, you know, you want to check it out. I, I want to check it out. I, I am curious. I'll do a little Vegas trip with you. Yeah, there's like some cool museums and stuff or exhibits down there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The, the shows are great. There's good yeah. meals to be had. Exactly. There are a lot of really good restaurants. Mm -hmm. It's funny. There's a guy at the gym. That, that's his thing. This guy, Corey, I've talked about. Oh, yeah. Uh, he must go down to Vegas, I don't know, six to 10 times a year. Oh my God, that sounds awful. No, he had no kids. Um, his girlfriend doesn't have any kids and the two of them, it's just like uh, he has a pretty cushy, it sounds like, you know, he built up a little coffee business. Yeah. Doesn't need to be there all the time. So I think he has like a decent amount of disposable income mm -hmm. plus a fair amount of free time. Plus he's not that old. Yeah, I don't know, 40-ish. Yeah. Sure. And that's just their thing. It's an easy, quick, direct flight. 
do they are they big partiers? He likes they like the restaurants, restaurants, okay. restaurants, and restaurants. And he said his girlfriend is more into the shows. But he, yeah, but he likes the occasional concert. But she's been, he said, to like literally all of the shows down there. Yeah, no, the shows are great. All the um, Cirque du Soleil shows are uh-huh. so incredible. I'm endlessly fascinated with Cirque du Soleil. Yeah, yeah. And then let's see, Adele just had a residency there. Somebody else yeah. just Usher. Uh, Oh yeah! Oh uh, yeah! Usher's the new one, right? Uh, like the last like year or so, I think. Okay, mm-hmm. and I think I could be wrong, but I swear I just read DM, uh, DM Run DMC is gonna be doing huh. a I residency because it was like the first like true hip hop or rapper. Yeah, I thought one of those guys passed away. I know that's why I'm like, yeah, ah. just one of them did. Yeah, I, I know, but I think they still. Months. Yeah, yeah, t- totally. Oh no, 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 no! It's Wu Tang Clan. Oh, that'd be oh, cooler yeah. because I mean, nothing against Run DMC. No, 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 but no, it's no. Like, it just, yeah. I was like, God, who is it? Because it's like an older group. But I remember Wu-Tang seeing- Wu-Tang in Vegas. Because I was thinking Wu-Tang, and I was thinking about our friend, our friend Doug Mellor, has this like hysterical yeah, joke, great joke about, the Wu-Tang about he was at a music festival, out of his mind on shrooms, and he was trying to go to his other friend's trailer, who's also a musician, uh-huh. and he almost walked into the Wu-Tang clans, and he trailer. just- and he just talks about how like he feels like he's probably the missing member of the Wu Tang Clan. I know. I, I, he talked about in a, in a parallel universe. There's a version of him uh-huh. uh, based on that choice where he's in the Wu Tang Clan. Like he uh-huh. talks his way in. Uh-huh. And I love like he talks about he's like it's like Method. What is it like Method Man and RZA and like you know he, like, he references like a few other ones. He's like and Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I love yeah. it. Uh, okay, well, very interesting story. Like so many, so many deaths there. Mm-hmm. And that's just, just a little sampling Luxor. of them. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that we've visited Vegas before, uh, I think on your side in the the tunnels underneath Vegas. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, you know. Tons of tunnels underneath Vegas for all yeah. the, to get all the, uh, well, to keep the casinos from flooding when there's, because it, it, it is crazy. I think a lot of people don't think about flooding in a desert. But, yeah. But I remember so uh huh, when I was like down there, my dad lived in like Sedona, Arizona or near there before then, which is very deserty. Mm-hmm. And I remember there was like this dry creek bed behind his uh, rental house. Yeah. And, you know, just by killing time, go down there and play, look for lizards or whatever, a little boy. And, uh, but I remember him being like, don't be really careful. And he's like, tell us when you're going down there. And, I, and he just, I think at some point they stopped letting me go down there because and it didn't make sense to my kid brain. I'm like, it's totally dry. But they talked about like when it rains hard enough because it's so dry and, yeah. the, and the ground is so hard. hard. Yeah. It can't it, absorb it. Yep. It just can't absorb the water very quickly. And so all these little gullies from the surrounding hills start flooding down into these dry creek beds. And, and it, fast. And fast. And all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, it will be, you know, enough water to wash you away and drown you. Yeah. And it's like, but like those tunnels in Las Vegas, you have so many tunnels so, the, so that uh, when a flash flood, you know, occurs, it directs the water underground instead of just through the strip. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, people, it's funny, like you forget that uh, so much of LA, I mean, it's essentially you're in a desert, Mm -hmm. you know, and they're like, what? And it's like, yeah, go live there for a year and tell me how your shit is covered in dust all the time. Yeah. All the time. You open a window, that's it. Your whole interior of your house is just dust. (laughs) It's wild. My my former um, stepmom was a dealer at one of the casinos, the Four Seasons, I think. Not Four Seasons. No, there's not a Four Seasons there. No, it's four. It was like, it wasn't one of the strip ones. It was one of the downtown ones, kind of like a... At that time, kind of like, eh, yeah. one, I can't remember the name of it. I thought I it was don't, four. But anyway. I don't know the old ones. Yeah. And, uh, but I remember as a kid, when this, this story just like, you know, reminded me of her talking about suicides at her hotel, mm-hmm. that it was actually very common. And, and we've talked about how common those things are with hauntings. Yeah. So it makes sense that Vegas is so haunted. But, you know, like you have these people who are, you know, gambling addic- addicts, she, mm-hmm. she would say oftentimes. Yeah. And go too hard yep. and lose so much money. And now they've like, they've lost everything. They're yeah. not going to be able to pay for their house. And in that moment of panic, people just like walk up to one of the balconies, walk up to the roof and throw themselves off. <sighs> well, yeah, and, and it's not just the gambling. It's like you've been probably drinking. True, you got a lot of stuff in your system. You're sleep deprived. Yep, yep. Which is yep. like part of the whole system there is mm-hmm. like, we'll keep feeding you yeah. drinks. We'll keep, keep you sleep deprived. We'll give you uh, coffee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, whatever you need just to keep you in at the table yeah. spending money. Gosh, can you can you I fucking hate Vegas? Can you imma- it is everything I hate in excess? <laughs> can you imagine um being in like one of those lobbies? I mean, how traumatic. I mean, obviously I know. obviously it's so traumatic 
you know, for the person who dies in their family. Yes, yes, But also, yes, yes. just if, as a random passerby. Yeah, like you're in the line for, for the buffet. I, I was thinking about that specifically, like, whoa. And this body just hits this person who was alive a literal second ago. Yeah. Is now dead in front of you. through the air. Mm-hmm. Because that's not. You're never going to forget that. No. And the odds of seeing that are, yeah. you know, truly one in a million. Yeah, that is, that will, that would haunt you. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, I was made a note about that, that like it makes sense to me that the suicide rates are very high there. Yeah. Okay, on the pyramid triangle. <laughs> <laughs> on the, in, Egyptian, in Egyptian triangle. Yes, the light show. It's like, I think that that's like what threw me off. I think it does a light show. Mm. Okay, I don't, yeah, I can't remember, yeah. Yeah. Um, I also made a, a note that is, you know, whatever. But it's interesting that they go so far with the good PR to cover up anything that happens. I mean, it makes sense to mm-hmm. me, but like- yeah, if you truly, if you were hearing stories in the news every single day or no one no would ever week go. about like suicide, 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 Wait, you know, like but this that's thing, cons- robbery, cons- murder. Right. Uh, and just imagine all the other abuses that happen. Rape, all these things are constantly yeah. going on there. It's just like a good reminder that when you go to Vegas, like you really do have to be careful. You do. And choose who you go to Vegas with wisely. Yeah. Like if you're going with friends who love to party and you love to party, like- they're the sketchy. reason the reason I hate Vegas is because I went there a couple times in my 20s and it was a fucking disaster nightmare. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was like, uh, so fucked up. We couldn't mm-hmm. help each other. We're yeah. a mess. Like people are so blitzed that they're just like acting in inappropriate ways. I, yeah. It was a nightmare. I yeah. hated it. Yeah. Yeah. All that excess can get really out of hand. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be so careful. Did you guys know that the whole thing of Vegas covering up, not covering up stuff, but not putting it in the media? That's why Tupac Shakur's murder didn't get um, solved for so long is because they were branding. Vegas was trying to rebrand oh as God. a family friendly environment. Oh. Um, and so like everything from like mayor down to like the law enforcement heads were like, we need to like get this out of here as soon as possible because yeah. it was like right in the middle of like, this is also a family town as mm-hmm. well as quote unquote sense. It makes sense yeah. to me that like money talks and it's like, you know, if you're some journalist making X amount of dollars and there's all this pressure from like the mayor's office and things and possibly, I mean, just frankly bribes yeah. of like, Here's twenty thousand dollars. Now shut up. Now Bury that, story, the story. that story goes away. Mm-hmm. It's on page seven, and then it's never printed again. And then, yep. like going back even further, obviously, like the the history of Vegas, the yeah, gangsters the and the mob, and it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, Vegas crime is, is woven into the DNA there. Certain mm-hmm. a certain amount of it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then obviously, so many like sad tragedies, like the the shooting that happened there. Yeah. Uh, at that concert, and I mean, and that didn't get as much attention. No, it's wild, as, actually, as shootings of with far smaller victim counts. Like yeah. that was an insane thing. And it, mm-hmm. and it launched a bunch of conspiracies because the story faded so fast. Yeah. And it's like- the False flag kind yep, of stuff. Yep, yep. All the crisis actor kind of nonsense. And I don't think that's true. I just think it was, again, uh, the powers that be in Vegas being like, we got to make this story go away. When that- This is terrible press for us. That- It's all about money. That shooting in Vegas yeah. makes me scared every time I go to a concert. Yeah. Every yeah. time I go, yeah. every like it just, I inherently feel a little like- we're not all walking through metal detectors. Yep. So, I mean, some shows you are, but not all. Yeah. And it, it freaks me out just a bit. Are you, uh, are you ready to tell your story now? I am. I am. I'm going to give a heads up. Oh, I have, we have a break. Oh, okay. Now is it my turn? Now it's your turn. Yay. Uh, I'm just going <laughs> to give a heads up because something happened to my eye yesterday and I think I'm going to be okay. Mm-hmm. But uh, if all of a sudden I have a, 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 a big pause just might be a second of just like my eye gushing. I don't know what is going on. Yeah, a little bit of watery eye. Well, yeah, I think I, I think I scratched my eye. Like mm-hmm. I, I wear contacts, and I think something got into my contact, and then your contact kind of moves a little bit in your eye, and I think yeah. it scraped the inside of my eye, which is a bizarre feeling. All right, Are you ready to head to Louisiana? Let's go. Okay. Do you got a Layla? Oh, double Layla. Mm-hmm. I've been doing double the last few weeks. Yeah, got these little. I don't think here. that's how you hold them. <laughs> like this? Little- no. Oh, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. Shouldn't you know that since you're mm-hmm. finishing school? That's how you squeeze them at finishing school. That's how you squeeze stress dolls at finishing school. But it's weird that I had to remind you of that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, <laughs> that actually hurts my, I don't like the way that feels. My, Does it hurt right here? Yeah. Like a forearm workout? Yeah. Yeah. It's like weird not to en- engage your pinky with it. It's like when you squeeze the thing, <laughs> look at like, I can't, I'm trying not to make my pinky move, but it feels like weird pressure in there. That's so funny. I feel it in the in the fatty palm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. 
enough of that. Okay. Hey, y'all. The name is Luke, and I'm writing to you from South Mississippi, located two hours due north of New Orleans, a city I know y'all keep so dear Mm. to your hearts. I don't know how familiar y'all are with the lore and traditions of this part of the country, which is the epitome of a melting pot. So much culture from all the corners of the earth brought together in this corner of our nation. I believe what makes it so much more unique is that so many people that settled here in the last few hundred years were not upper class or highly educated or from highly educated lineages. Very common folks who lived off the land and brought many of their folklores and creatures of myth with them. And we've been carrying on these traditions through the generations long after them. Does this give more doubt or validity to the fact that there are things among us in this world that linger in the shadows? I'll leave that up to you. As a child, I was brought up in the outdoors, listening to the stories and lessons of the men and women that were taught to live off the land, whether it was necessary or not. Farming, gardening, hunting, gathering, even signs of approaching weather and the upcoming changes of the seasons. Listening was a critical part of our education and was expected of us. This would, at times, lead into hearing scary tales and myths about creatures that were widely spoken of, such as the Rougarou, Bigfoot, and the Skunk Ape. Stories Mm. that may or may not have been manipulated to keep the kids from staying out after dark. But though... Uh, But there were certain stories that hit closer to home. The one that rang through to me, uh, I cannot speak. The one that rang through the decades for me is the 15 Mile Creek Monster. I know, I know, such a creative name. Of all the locations for this being to roam, it chose the most eloquently named stretch of stretch of creek bed in all of Mississippi. As its name states, it is a creek estimated to run 15 miles south through the 200,000 acre Homochito National Forest mm. and feeds into the Homochito River. Such an untouched and isolated mass of forest is a fitting place for a mythical something or someone to call home. And the old men at the hunting club took full advantage of this when story time started at the skinning shed after a long day of deer hunting. It doesn't seem like it's been 25 years since I began to hear the tales of the creature that would haunt my dreams as a young man, but it's true. I couldn't have been older than eight or nine the first time I heard about this monster. But it's honestly the only encounter that I can clearly recall other than my own. First rule of business after a successful hunt was the the slaughter an old 55-gallon drum cut in half containing the waste from the kill, the old tracking hounds enjoying their fresh scraps after a successful retrieval. At least one rugged southern feller was going to be rinsing off his knives while his hands were still stained with blood, an old halogen work light radiating heat down from the sun-bowed board it was half-nailed to, half-tied to, a weathered old Chevy backed up to a campfire as we gathered around the truck bed. I was freezing, but I remember trying to hide my shivers and to be tough around the grown folks. These men weren't related to us in any way, shape, or form, but they all earned the title of uncle. I respected them and showed them that respect during every encounter we had with one another. I'd hang on every word they spoke, trying to soak up the knowledge of the living legends that I knew they were. And they were that. We we ever tell you about the 15 Mile Creek Monster? They asked as I hesitantly replied with a timid and shaky, no, sir. They all gave a little chuckle that seemed to come straight from their bellies. I don't think he'd hurt you. He just wants his privacy and wants to make sure you understand that, they said as they prepared me for the tale of their encounter. These men would roam into the woods for hours upon hours at a time in their faded and worn old camo with nothing more than a rifle, a pocket knife, and a flashlight not mi- not much bigger than the ink pen. After the daylight finally made its way out of the creek bottom, they still refused to use their flashlights, said it would run the deer out, and it was better to slip out just as discreetly as you slipped in. The most important clearly stated rule in this hunting club was that you never began your exit from a still hunt until it was absolutely dark. That means no remains of sunlight should be visible. The night their encounter happened, it happened to be a clear night with a full moon, and that was a blessing considering the strength or lack thereof their flashlights. Danny and Charles were trying to make their way back to the truck and started their individual treks around the same time. Now, I must include a detail about this creek to give clarity about the eerie silence that falls in the woods after all the critters settle in for the night. This isn't a flowing brook that emits a peaceful, sleep-inducing sound. This is a sand and rock bed creek that creeps slowly and silently through the canopy-covered bottoms of the land. Imagine a silence so overwhelming that all you hear is your own footsteps and heavy breathing as you make your way through the dark. 
Danny was the first to notice anything out of the ordinary. He felt a strange sensation that he was not only being watched, but also being followed. Overwhelmed by this feeling, he decided to slip across the white creek bank and see if he could spot anything following him as he crossed the moon-soaked white sand terrain. About halfway across the sandy patch, he heard a bipedal creature high-stepping across the water behind him. He pressed on with his head on swivel, but never saw anything come into view. He crossed the creek again with the same exact situation repeating itself. He did this several times with the same result. Finally, he realized he couldn't hear the splashing anymore. Hoping that he may have lost whatever was following him, he turned on his small light and made a mad dash for the pickup truck. Around this time was when Charles had the same exact feeling across his body and just so happened to have the same reaction. He crossed the creek and heard a bipedal splashing behind him as well and repeated the same process with the same results multiple times. The only difference between Charles and Danny was that Charles wasn't giving this thing a chance to follow him. He turned on his small light and made a run for the truck. He could hear a loud crunching through the leaves behind him as he gave every ounce of energy he had to make it back to the safety of his truck. He could see the reflection of the moon on the windshield and knew he was almost there. He gave one final push as he closed in on his target. He grabbed the door handle and snatched it open and with all his might launched himself into that lifted Chevy only to be greeted by screams of absolute terror. In his panicked state, he forgot that Danny rode with him to the woods and wasn't thinking about the possibility of him sitting in the truck when he pounced inside. It was a small miracle that no one was shot during this incident. They both managed to get out of the woods without injuries that night. I was absolutely consumed by this story as I sat there with my jaw dropped, listening to them tell me of their experience, amazed at Danny and Charles as they laughed the whole time. We ain't trying to scare you, little man. We just know these woods aren't ours after dark. They're barely ours during the daylight. They said like they should have given me, like this should have given me some type of comfort. I think I was most surprised by the fact that these men never questioned what could have been following them that night. They just knew that they weren't welcome any longer and they were out of line to have overstayed their welcome. This was one of the many stories I heard about the 15 Mile Creek monster as I grew up and each one seemed to mimic the next in the sense that it may have been more than one creature. Other details that I picked up over the years included the fact that this is a tall creature of slim stature, and it's said to be a hairy creature, but not long and shaggy like you'd imagine a Sasquatch, but rather short, slick hair similar to a whitetail. It was a few years after I had heard of this incident with Danny and Charles, and I was closer to 11 at this time, when my mom, my stepdad, and myself made our way out to the hunting club late one evening. Wound up with excitement brought on by the days of hunting ahead of us, we decided to hop in our Jeep and make the country loop of a few gravel roads that surrounded us. It was a cool, crisp night. The moon must have been sitting right that night because the bigger animals were stirring. We tried our hardest to see as far around the next curve as possible, waiting on headlights to catch up. We'd catch a glimpse of a few deer here and there, a few deer over there, and we'd spot them then slipping back into the pines as we approached. But then it just stopped no more deer. We'd gone a couple of miles and when it, it was like they just weren't there anymore. Huh, that's weird. They must have settled in for the night, my stepdad dad. My stepdad said, reassuring me that I wasn't the only one that noticed that everything had gone quiet. And that's when we saw the fox. We rounded the bend and saw a small fox sitting up ahead in the middle of the road, just sitting there. I noticed his head had a slight wobble as we crunched atop the rocky road. Think he got hit by a car? My mom asked as we rolled down our windows to examine the animal. Maybe so, baby. He's acting odd, stated my stepdad. I just stared in amazement at how beautiful this animal was. It was like he didn't even see us. He just stared into the night. We, of course, didn't dare touch him. You never know what kind of harm an injured animal can inflict on you out of pure fear. We just watched him and studied him for a few minutes or so until we saw it headlights approaching us up ahead. It was another local family that we knew of but didn't know well. They finished blocking the small road as they parked with the same small fox seated between our vehicles. Y'all hit him? The man asked kindly as he examined the animal. Nah, just drove up on him sitting like this. Y'all see any deer up on the road? My stepdad asked, truly just to be polite and make conversation with the man. Quickly transitioning to a confused demeanor, the man replied, no deer, not in the last few miles but we did see some eyes about a quarter mile back. Some eyes? That was a pretty vague description. What does that even mean? My stepdad easily dismissed the man's odd statement as we said our goodbyes and eased on down the road. 
I watched that fox in the red glow of our taillights as we left, never moving. And by this time, I was also leaving the fox behind as I started pondering the eyes statement made by the gentleman back down the road. I was craving more details, being a bit of a creeper. I wanted to see what they saw. And it wouldn't be long before I did. We made it a quarter mile up the road when we came to a sharp turn. There was a high embankment right across the ditch. No way you'd miss this curve. About a nine to ten foot high red clay wall with a twisted old wooden pole erected a couple of feet back from the edge. And there they were. The eyes. Growing up in the outdoors, one of the many things you are taught about is eyes. You can tell a lot about an animal based on their eyes. The size of the eyes can tell you if it's nocturnal or not. The wider the spacing, the bigger the head on the animal. And the colors can vary sometimes, depending on the species. My stepdad immediately began to evaluate the eyes, and the hypotheses began. What in the world is that? Asked my mother. My stepdad responded with, not a clue. The eyes were large and spaced around six to eight inches apart. They were smoothly hovering a couple feet above the ground, almost like a young heifer that had bedded up for the night. Is that a cow laying down there? I asked as we gazed at the bright green eyes staring back. Shouldn't be any cattle out this far in the forest, but it's a good size head on it. My stepdad responded. The main problem we had with actually getting a good visual was our distance from the embankment. By the time we noticed the glow of the eyes, we were too close. Even with the high beams burning bright, we were only illuminating the clay wall and the knee-deep grass growing atop it. Just enough light was peering over the top to make the green eyes glow. Then another set of eyes a few feet to the right began to appear. But these were different, more intense. They were the brightest red eyes I'd ever seen glow. The creature was inches away from the wooden pole as if it had been right behind this thick pole the entire time. There's another one, my mom noticed. At at this point, I was beginning to silently panic as I wonder if there were more eyes around us that we just couldn't see. It seemed like a logical fear to have at that moment. And that's when the red eyes decided to instill a true panic in my small, trembling body. The red eyes began to slowly rise. My stepdad was trying to explain to me that whatever it was must have gotten scared and decided to climb up the pole. I don't know if he was just brushing it off or if he could feel the tension rising in the vehicle and felt that it needed to be diffused before I was truly traumatized. I'd seen animals scale trees before. It's a jerking motion as they grip another handful of the tree during their ascent. This was a smooth motion, as if the creature had been squatted and slowly began rising. It seemed to stop eight or nine feet up. I was frozen. My mother was frozen. My stepdad was squinting his eyes as he glued to the windshield, exhausting every brain cell, trying to figure out what it was. The eyes slowly turned to the left and then disappeared. You could see what appeared to be light reflecting off its shoulders, the shine of the slick, flat hair I had been told of. It wasn't a wide set of shoulders either. And in a split second that could be made out of the figure, you could tell it was narrow. It reminded me of an animal built for speed. You could hear my heart pounding in my chest, and the silence was broken by my stepdad who commented, Well, that was odd. I have no idea how close we were to these creatures, but it was too close for me. We slowly continued forward and made our way through the churn as we watched the first set of green eyes slowly fade into the abyss of darkness that engulfed the woods around us. No one said a word. It was like we were riding in a daze. We made it a few miles up the road when I saw a green glow of a reflective sign as we approached an old wooden bridge. 15 Mile Creek. I felt the color leave my face. My mother didn't know that I'd been told the stories of the monster, but my stepdad was the one who had previously found pure joy in giving me nightmares over these stories. He kept jerking his head as he would occasionally glance at me out of the side of his eye. He knew I had put the pieces together. I was beginning to understand what the men at camp meant when they said we were just being warned by the 15 Mile Creek monster, reminded we weren't welcome there after dark. I don't know the significance of the red fox in the road. I don't know if its disabled state was even related to all the eyes we saw. I've spent many a days riding and walking through the forest and saw a lot of things I couldn't explain. This one that truly struck me and one that I definitely never let go of. I still roam the nearby woods on a regular basis. I haven't been in the national forest much since I was finally old enough to hunt on my own though. I'm not necessarily scared. I just have enough sense to not go where I'm not welcome. I took the hint when it was politely given. I shared this story with my 10-year-old son before I documented my encounter for y'all. He doesn't believe me, but I think (laughs) he's in denial because he's already seen some very peculiar things in the woods. I'm a devout Christian, and I spend more of my Sundays in the pulpit than in the pew. The supernatural intrigues me, 
And I always look to the Bible when I question stories that I hear on your podcast. There are accounts of witchcraft and possession throughout the Bible, but creatures like the one I have mentioned above used to stump me. As I grew and as I became more educated in biblical text, I became familiar with the Nephilim. It just made sense. I'm not saying that this is a positive identification, but it gave me some peace to know that I have a sliver of a chance at an explanation. I'll continue to spend my days outdoors as I teach my three sons the same things that I was taught, and I know they'll have unexplained encounters of their own. It's like a rite of passage in our Southern culture. Who knows, maybe one day they'll be sharing a story of their own with you. Thank you for taking the time to read this and stay spooky, y'all, and put some extra sugar in your tea for me. With love <laughs> with love and respect, Uncle Luke. Uncle Luke. I love it. Yeah. I love this story. Yeah. Yeah. And you and you said you did some additional like looking into the Nephilim, right? Because like- Yeah, because I, that was a word I had literally never heard. Tyler, have you heard it pronounced like that? Yeah, Nephilim? Yeah. Okay. Because I, I remember like just- I, I was just making sure because I remember when I- I looked up ac- pronunciation yeah, guides, bro. When I first came across the world, uh, word as well- that like it, um, I was like, I thought there was like an alternate one. I don't know. I got confused. Sure. Well, and there might be. And, and I think actually just to like connect it to the lore of like bad magic at the very first episode of Time Suck was about the space lizards, about the reptilian, the uh, Anunnaki and Unaki. I've heard it pronounced like both ways. Uh-huh. You know, these supposed creatures. And there are definitely some people who try to connect the Anunnaki with the Nephilim. With oh. like, um, it's a, it's been so long since I looked into it, but it's like these... Is I think giants or like the but like people like speculate what they could be like fallen angels. Yeah, I have giants, some yeah. some info to share. I want you to know that when I first read it, yeah, I thought of I think it's in like Winnie the Pooh, like the big elephant. It's it has like a funny name that sounds sort oh, of like funny. Nephilim, and I was like, that's not it. <laughs> um, okay. So I was entirely unfamiliar with this, yeah. this term, even despite being like raised Catholic and having read the Bible. And I mean, I haven't read the Bible in its entirety, yeah. but just like definitely like familiar with biblical stories. So my Googling provided so many answers. And obviously I'm not a theologian and I'm not a deeply religious person, but that said, you know, I respect everyone's like beliefs and their right to their beliefs and surrounded by so many people of varying faith. So I love knowing people who are committed to their faith and seek out explanation in the Bible. Like Mm -hmm. I just, I think it's fascinating. Um, So for those not familiar with the Nephilim, the basic answers that I found are just, I'll share with them, just keeping in mind, this isn't time suck. I didn't do a deep dive. Yeah, like yeah, These yeah. are very basic answers. So Wikipedia describes it as a mysterious being or beings in the Hebrew Bible who are described as being large and strong. And the Hebrew word Nephilim is sometimes translated as giants and sometimes taken to mean the fallen ones. And their origins are like disputed widely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Then Britannica says in the Hebrew Bible in the Christian Old Testament, a group of mysterious beings or people of unusually large size and strength who lived both before and after the flood, the Nephilim are referenced in Genesis and Numbers and are possibly referred to in Ezekiel. The Hebrew word Nephilim is sometimes directly translated as giants. Um, It's taken from the Hebrew word nephal, to fall, Uh, but they identify the Nephilim but the identity of the Nephilim is debated by scholars. And then lastly, you find reference to the Nephilim. In Genesis 6, 1 through 4, it tells readers that the Nephilim, uh, when translated into English, means fallen ones, were the product of copulation between divine beings, uh, sons of God, and human women, daughters of Adam. And the Nephilim are known as great warriors and biblical giants. Yeah, I think there was like some people who interpreted like Goliath as being Nephilim. Okay. Like of David and Goliath. And huh. also Nimrod. Yes. From yeah, the Nimrod, the mighty hunter. Yeah. Nice yeah. tie-in. So, yeah. Okay, so um, I, and then also like in all of my digging, well, I'm going to show you, I have two photos because I I didn't have anything to, to, I didn't have an image to conjure up in my brain of like yeah. what this could be because I was sort of thinking like Skinwalker when he's a tall, thin, narrow stature, slick, like, you know, uh, a, seems like it's eluding people and tricking people. So I have two photos to show you. Uh, My first photo uh, comes from Mm openart.com and it was posted by Killjoy Jake. Uh, And and so then this sort of feeds into like the fallen angel kind of mythology. Mm -hmm. Like a beautiful piece of art, actually. Just this like sort of like creepy floating being. Yeah, yeah. And like no gender identification, just, yeah, now, just a body. Now I'm remembering when people would try to connect the Anunnaki to the uh, to the Nephilim, acting like you know, like these fallen, like meaning fallen, just thinking that that was like you know ancient people not understanding what spaceships were. 
Mm. But these things are falling from the skies. And oh. and there's like that, that there was speculation and you know amongst these circles, but that these fallen creatures, these this uh, you know extraterrestrial race, then mated with humans, which goes into like the whole uh, conspiracy of like okay. the reptilian bloodlines, which I'm not a believer of by the way, but I but I'm just fascinated with like where that stuff comes from. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then my second story, or my second story, my second photo. Uh, from tombraider.fandom.com posted by I don't know who. This is this felt more uh paranormal, I guess, to me. It yeah. just felt creepier and stranger. Um, but it looks like there's a Nephilim character uh mythology in Laura Croft Tomb Raider. Huh. So I uh, like I haven't watched those ones. Me uh, either. I think there's also this is reminding me of the strain. Which was that Guillermo del Toro? Like it was like an FX series a while back, and it was oh, about like yeah, Stragoi, kind of- these like you know this vampire kind of legends. And I wa- I'm pretty sure that either in the comics or in the show or both, they also tried to connect the Stragoi to the Nephilim and stuff. Like I I, I love like um for lack of a better term, like monster lore too. Yeah, you yeah. Know, like people like, um, where did these ancient references come from? What were they actually describing? Did it connect to this other ancient reference? And did it connect to, the, to this modern story? Is it some creature in the woods now? Well, what I, and what I love about it is like, uh, you know, we discuss religion very lightly here in a variety of ways. Like, mm-hmm. you know, oftentimes we're bringing it up. We're like, oh my God, you've got something in your house, get a priest. Mm, yeah. <laughs> right, like that, that's like a knee-jerk reaction that we have yeah. of like, get the house cleansed and blessed and like all of this. Mm-hmm. And if you're, a, you know, a devout believer, like I was, gra- you know, I was raised, both my parents would go to church all the time. Like that's, mm-hmm. you know, their world. They would say, like, if I talked to my dad about this, he'd be like, well, yeah, like th- these things come from the Bible, like the best things and the worst things in the world all kind of come from the Bible. And, you know, God is like telling you how to like beat this. And when you choose to like pray only in your moments of need, like God is always there for you. He will always be there and support you and all of these things. Uh, and it is kind of a funny thing that we just like immediately are like, get a priest. Like we're mm-hmm. not even religious people. Yeah. And and yet we're like, ah, turn to God, you know? And so yeah. my dad has like a very strong belief that like it is a certain kind of way to bring people into faith. And that is oftentimes how people find their way there. They're in crisis yeah. and then they make their way to religion. And so I like this sort of angle of like Luke is saying like, he's not in crisis, but like mm-hmm. he understands this angle. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? My yeah. brain is so foggy. My no. eye hurts so bad. Oh, no. No, it does. Yeah, it does make sense. I mean, I, I'm fascinated with like, you know, the, the totality of like the amount of stories we've covered now and looking into other stories that have never made the show that, uh, you know, people have cleansed houses, people, whatever exercise spirits from all t- different faiths. Yeah. You know, from and, like- and for. You know, Native American shaman to, you know, there's like, you know, the equivalent of uh, exorcists and like, you know, Hindu, Buddhist faiths. I'm 99% sure both of those, if not, you know, definitely like one of those. Yeah. And just, uh, there's just something about the power of faith that does show itself in the world of paranormal, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, through a variety of religions and, and different, like, you know, spiritual belief systems. Well, I think it's it very makes, interesting. It, I think it, to me, it makes sense because it's like, if you are a devout believer in any theology. hmm you are putting your faith into something that you can't see. Mm-hmm. And that you can you can say that about the paranormal. Oh, yeah. You're having yeah. like a, a blind, a different kind of blind faith, mm-hmm. but this like very real haunting is happening to you and you can't see it, but you, you know. Yeah, I think most people like, you know, there's a connection between the paranormal and the spiritual realm. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, it's things not of this world. Yeah. Not, not that we can define currently. Yeah. I, w- I was fascinated just to also like- Scientifically define. Yeah. Or yeah. scientifically prove. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like beyond a shadow of a doubt kind of yeah. proof. Uh, I'd never heard of this. And so I I loved like, here we are, uh, you know, mm-hmm. into our fifth year of stories. Yeah. And learning something. And learning something, uh, a new thing to be potentially afraid of. <laughs> uh, for me, like learning a new piece of theology. Like, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, just all these, these things. But Tyler, you said that you knew what the Nephilim was, right? Yeah. Just from like, the Bible and church. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't know if like, cause I know you're also into like movies and comic books and like, you know, have that lore as well. So I didn't know where you picked it up along the way. Yeah, definitely from the church. It's like a, I was like in love with the old Testament for a long time. Yeah. And even like the, like the uh, apocryphal books and like the books of the Bible that didn't make it into the quote unquote Bible. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, there's like so many stories from like that culture of people that we don't like, that aren't like quote unquote canonized or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. That are still just out there. And then like 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 you guys have said before, like being able to like see that same type of thing in different cultures is is a 
is pretty cool. Yeah, I think it all yeah. connects to something. Something we don't mm-hmm. totally, totally understand or agree on. Yeah, yeah. and I, I do love this like thread of just like connected humanity. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. we all we're all afraid of the things that we can't see. Mm-hmm. Things that go bump in the night, or maybe things that like you know are out there that aren't yeah. bad. Yeah, you know, just this. We're also space. curious about what happens after death. Yeah, which ghosts. That's a part of that. You know, curiosity. Yeah, it's like I think a lot of people take comfort, uh, myself included, in all these ghost stories. Where it's like again, if like just one of them is true, it it doesn't it doesn't just open up like possibilities of other things. It also just like proves that would prove that like our spirits, souls, whatever you want to call it, don't end. You know, like with our, you know, when we shed these mortal coils, you know, like with yeah. our, when our body's <gasps> gone. Why did you just throw Layla on the ground? Oh, it was an accident. I don't, I just feel like somebody who went to finishing school would never do that. <laughs> um, yeah, but I love this story. And uh, I love that, you know, Luke is a very devout man mm-hmm. and that he still enjoys our show. Yeah, I love and, that too. And can, and is looking for answers in a different way than how I would look for an answer. Mm-hmm. I just, yeah, I really value that. Mm-hmm. So thanks, Luke. Thanks, Luke. Who's really fun. Uh, his email was like, you know, I don't read the initial emails, but so I can see the thread with Heather. And he was just like, I just think that Luke is probably like a really cute guy. Oh, uh, funny. He was like a, like a sweet, like yummy, just like, oh, okay. no, like, <laughs> like, like, a, well, like an uncle. Yeah, just yeah, like, yeah. Just like jovial and uh-huh. like wants to teach you something. I don't know. Yeah. He just seemed really charming. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, do you want to do some shout outs? Yeah. Do you want to start? Yeah. And what is wild mm-hmm. this week yeah. is I have no spooky shout outs. Like, oh. no, because people like request different dates, like sure. birthdays, Valentine's Day is coming. Y'all were full for Valentine's Day. Okay. Full. <laughs> so many like people want, you know, sure. but I guess this week, nobody has anything going on of importance. So right. fine. Screw you. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting what we do here and making our monthly charitable donations a possibility. Joe Godfrey, Michelle Gricey. What's good? Okay. <laughs> Alicia Lopez. Kim Cuddy. That sounds like something. Mm-hmm, like Kid Cuddy? Yeah, I was like, wait a second. Uh, Aaron Bales. Charles Zapiak. One Sock Witch. That's pretty funny. Do you lose a lot of socks in the dryer? Adam. And Torrance Gardner. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the uh, these following Annabelles as well for supporting our show. Sweet Zapple Pie. Nice. <laughs> little reference to Kemper there. My Zapple's mother. Uh, Zareda Conception or Concepcion. Uh, Rachie Ellie. Letty, Amber Frolick, or Frolic, Connor Fuchs, Anthony Harris Jr., Travis Irwin, Nicole Crazy Cat Lady Zerba. Oh, Nicole read the Warrior series. <laughs> and Grace Gorda. She probably did. Maybe she's really, maybe she is Aaron Hunter. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the several authors. Yep. Uh, and that's our show. If you got, if you don't got any spoopy shout outs, uh, thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death You can email us for everything else, info at scared to death podcast.com. Thank you to Tyler C editing and publishing today's show. Thanks to Heather Rylander organizing the My Story emails. Book editor Drew Atana for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number five. Thank you to Molly Jean Box for finding the story I told this week. We're on YouTube if you want to watch the show. On Facebook and Instagram where we post pics that accompany episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast. Uh, Also on TikTok, uh, same handle. We have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, full of fellow horror lovers. And that's it. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scare to death. Bad Magic Productions. But you didn't go to finishing school. I didn't need to. I finished you. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it also one- sounded really inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, it did.